So as we make our way through women in the Bible, we have trudged through the Old Testament. And of course, we could have um, talked about so many different women in the Old Testament. We missed a lot of the what we call the matriarchs, like Hagar and Sarah and, uh, and Rebecca. We really didn't go into those characters because... You know, they, they seem to be major characters, and I'm trying to hit more thematic uh, elements as well as women you may not have heard about. And today, we're starting with the Gospels, primarily the disciples of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus, women disciples of Jesus, those who follow Jesus. Now, if you let's go ahead and read uh, Luke 8, 1 through 3, and we're going to talk about some of the disciples and the twelve. And uh, talk a little bit about discipleship, and and then we'll go into specific characters. So Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Soon afterwards, he, that being Jesus, went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Chusa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. Now, the reason why I chose this particular text is because it points out that Jesus had more than 12 disciples. In fact, if you go to Luke 9, um, he sends out the 12, but then if you go to Luke 10, uh, go to Luke 10, uh, Luke 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them out, uh, sent them on ahead of him in pairs in every town. I have a footnote here. Okay, 72. So what we find, go back to chapter 8, by the way, Luke 8. So what we find is that Jesus' disciples, there are more than 12, but we know that the 12 are an important feature in Jesus the, in Jesus' movement because it really embodies and portrays the restoration of the 12 tribes of Israel. So we believe that Jesus called 12 disciples to model the restoration of those tribes. However, Jesus had a lot of followers. Many of them were women. What makes this particular passage unique are the verbs used to describe the women. Okay, First, we have Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene is an important character because when you see all of the lists of women throughout the Gospels, Mary Magdalene is always listed first. As I mentioned to you, names in the Bible matter. And when someone is listed first or someone is recognized first, that elevates that person to a, a position of honor or a position of power. For instance, it's Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla is listed first in that couple because we believe that Priscilla and Aquila, Priscilla being the leader of the, the church and, and Aquila, or them being a team, but Priscilla having authority. And uh, other than the introduction of Aquila and Priscilla in Acts 18, every time Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned, Priscilla's name come first, came first, comes first. We also see in that what we call the household codes in Ephesians, Ephesians especially, Paul will say something like, Y'all need to submit to one another. Wives, submit to your husbands. He addresses wives first and lifts them up by doing so. And then he says, husbands, honor your wives. So he, it's an equalizer, not a subserving it. He doesn't put women in a subservient position. He makes them equal. Y'all, y'all submit to one another. So the listing of names and whoever comes first is really important. That's why we have, name me three disciples off the bat. Peter, James, and John. Who's always listed first in the disciples? Peter. And we know Peter is, is a person of authority who is honored So in the tradition. So Mary Magdalene, whenever you see these women appear, she's always mentioned and always mentioned first. Now, the thing about Mary Magdalene um, is that uh, Magdala, by the way, is a town, I think it's in northern uh, Israel, around uh, the Sea of Galilee, if I'm not mistaken. Mary Magdalene has quite a reputation, and tradition states that she not only had these seven demons exercised, which is not only affirmed here in Luke 8, but also in John, but her tradi the tradition surrounding Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene is that she's a prostitute. 
and a seductress. But when you read the Bible, there is no evidence whatsoever that she was either a prostitute or a seductress. The most likely tradition of that was when that came along in the 6th or 7th century, when Gregory the Great, who was a bishop of the Catholic Church, was rising to power, and if we can read through the agenda, was that Mary Magdalene competed with Peter for an honorable place among the saints, because these are when the, the saints started to become popular, when the Catholic Church started to consolidate power in the 6th through the 8th centuries. Gregory the Great consolidated power of the Pope. Okay, So if you think about the Catholic Church or the Church before the 6th century, there was no one Pope. It was a result of a consolidation of power by Gregory the Great. And if you're the Pope and you're consolidating power, I want you to think through this. As a pope, you're going to consolidate power by saying, I, I alone, I am the pope of it, Rome, and I alone am, have, a, have a clear line to Peter. So what you're going to do is you're going to elevate Peter, and you're going to start to dismantle the saints who compete with Peter, one of whom is Mary Magdalene. In the Greek Orthodox Church, or in the Greek Church in the East, Mary Magdalene was considered not only a saint down the road, but also an apostle. And so the Pope and the Catholic Church said, we can't have this. So what they started to do is they started to build a narrative that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute and a seductress. And then it was replicated within pop culture, like movies like The Last Temptation of Christ, um, a lot of pop culture surrounding whether or not she was married to Jesus. You know, if you remember your 60s and 1960s and 70s, kind of like, you know, kind of pop culture, you know, uh, news weeks that would come out on Easter. So a lot of the, um, a lot of this tradition surrounding Mary Magdalene is more result of the, of the, of the Catholic church and tradition than the truth of scripture. So Mary Magdalene is actually a pretty honored person in scripture in all four gospels. She's always listed and she's always listed first. The second thing that is important here is I want to turn your attention to the um, to the other two women, Joanna, the wife of Herod Stewart, Shusa, and Susanna. We don't know much about Susanna, but what we do know is that Mary Magdalene, Susanna, and Joanna, especially Mary Magdalene, unlike tradition, actually presents her as a benefactor of Jesus. If anything, she wasn't a prostitute or a seductress. She was probably a very powerful noble woman who hung out with ladies like Joanna, who would have been a part of the uh, nobility of Herod's uh, administration, okay? And they were so honored in their community that they had resources that provided for the Jesus movement. I'm using that word very, uh, by the way, very scholarly Jesus movement, just to tell you it's not Jesus, it's the entire movement. He had to fund Jesus, and the keeper of the till was who, by the way? Judas, yeah, thank you. You know, this entire movement needed funding, okay? Um, this, uh, this messianic movement. <clears throat> and it was these women, very powerful women, who provided uh, resources for this movement. Now, the other word that I want to turn your attention to, uh, in verse 3, um, it says, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, and many others, who provided for them. Does anybody have a different word for provided for them? Does anybody have? What is supported? Michael? Ministered. Ministered. This is really important. The word is deacon. They deaconed him. Why does your Bible have support? Why does your Bible have provide? Why does Michael have the only Bible with the word ministered? Because the English, again, a tradition of English bias in the translation. This is a word that we translate deacon. They deacon, they were, these are the earliest deacons. Okay? By the way, you don't see anybody laying hands on them. They're deacons because of what they do. They're ministering in the movement. Yes, ma'am. How in some of the churches, females are not allowed to become deacons? I'm, uh, that would take us a long time to explain tonight, <laughs> but, uh, but I can, can tell you later. 
Um, but, uh, but again, the, the biblical evidence, it's a good question, Diane. It's, it is a good question. I don't want to make light of it. It's just, it would take us off track because when we go through this by the Bible study of women in the Bible, we see the importance of women as, in, as in their place in the, in the church. Yeah. But you know, there are other traditions that, that think differently. So, uh, so it would be a kind of a conversation of more of Baptist history and heritage, and I'm afraid I would bore you. Huh. We can do it another time. But, <clears throat> but I'd rather let the Bible, rather than my Baptist heritage, speak for itself. And that's the important thing. This is not a Baptist reading of Scripture. It's not a cooperative Baptist reading of Scripture or a Southern Baptist reading of Scripture. This is a reading of Scripture. And the word is deacon. They deaconed. They ministered. The word is minister to Jesus out of their own resources. So not only are these women benefactors, okay, to be honored and to take that place, but they're also in that role of ministry and deaconing, okay? Deaconing as a, as a verb. That's in your notes. And they become models because, and I want you to understand this. Uh, it's a little bit kind of heady, but... Very important. Luke, by the way, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And if you read Luke chapter 1 and Acts chapter 1, he's writing to Theophilus, who we believe is a very um, wealthy person. And what we believe when we read Luke and Acts is that Luke is trying to inspire and encourage Theophilus to become a supporter of the church. And there's a lot more in Luke and Acts that play a part in the language of, of how Luke is trying to inspire and uh, encourage Theophilus to invest in this movement called uh, of, of Jesus' Messiahship. And very effectively, by the way. Of course, you have Luke and Acts. If you do Acts, that's where the big inspiration comes. You know, where, where do you sit, Theophilus? Are you going to support this movement or not? There's Paul hanging out in Rome by Acts chapter 28. We don't know how the story ends, but if you write that check, Paul has a better chance. Okay? Uh, questions, thoughts before we move on to Mary and Martha? All right. Uh, anybody else know another benefactor, a wealthy woman who also is a described as a deacon? Anybody trivia, Bible trivia? In the Bible, outside of Luke and Acts, she's described as a deacon. In fact, the word deacon ascribed to her is the male word for deacon. It's not deaconess, it's deacon. Phoebe, in Romans chapter 16, he says, uh, Paul says, um, and uh, please welcome Phoebe, who is a deacon, and not only a deacon, but honor her as a patron, as a benefactor of the church who has provided for us. So Phoebe is another minister, deacon. And then we have, of course, Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla's named first in their house church. And then if you read through Romans 16, there are about six to eight other women who are hosting churches in their home. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so Luke 10, 38 through 42, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, this is Jesus with Mary and Martha. You know Mary and Martha because Jesus was good friends with Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. If you go to John 11, Lazarus, of course, dies. There's the resurrection of Lazarus. You know Jesus' intimacy because of the very frank conversations that Mary and Martha have with Jesus. They're not afraid to speak what's on their mind. Nor does Jesus silence them. Okay? And Lazarus, when he dies, even though Jesus knows the end of the story, weeps at the loss of his friend because he stands with us in the midst of our own grief. Even though we know the resurrection of the dead at the final days, Jesus still weeps with us when we weep. This story is a little more intimate. We don't know where Lazarus is, but we know that Mary and Martha and their intimacy still play a part in Jesus' life. Let's read Luke 10, 38. Now as they, they being Jesus and the disciples, went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Notice who's Notice who's first. Is it Mar Mary? It's, we say Mary and Martha, but notice Ma Martha is mentioned first. She's the elder sister. She's the householder. Okay? It says that Martha welcomed him. This word welcome is a particular root word in which it's a divine welcome. 
So there are two words for welcome. One is just welcoming someone. Hey, welcome. And then there is another word for welcome in which you invite someone as you would invite uh, and provide hospitality as if entertaining angels unawares. And this particular word for welcome is that divine welcome where you're creating a space in which God's work. By the way, that word welcome and used in this sense is used more in Luke and Acts than all of the other New Testament books combined. Because Luke is trying to create a Theophilus, he's trying to convince Theophilus to create a welcoming space in which Theophilus is going to invest in the church and create that divine space where God shows up through Jesus Christ. So this word, when, when Martha welcomes Jesus, it's, a, it's an opening up of a space where divine things, where, where the spirit moves. Verse 39, she had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. This is controversial. In the ancient world, no woman would sit at a rabbi's feet. In fact, the woman would, should have been with Martha. Mary should have been with Martha, providing and doing the domestic work of providing a meal. Martha complains about this later, but for now, I want to I want to just see what Mary is doing. She is at the feet of a rabbi, very controversial, because the only place, the only person who should sit at the foot of a rabbi is a male pupil. It is unheard of for a female to take the place of a male pupil at the foot of a rabbi. So what is Luke showing here? Luke is showing here that women can have a place as a disciple, as a pupil of Jesus, that men who, who are only allowed to sit at the ra- feet of a rabbi, that no longer applies in the, in the Christian church. And again, we see this over and over again as the Holy Spirit empowers the church of women becoming equal and par- partners and participants in the kingdom of God. And Mary is just an embodiment of taking the place of what was reserved for a male pupil. That's why, by the way, that's why Martha complains. It's, Martha didn't complain because she had a lot of stuff to do. Martha complained because her sister was doing something that no woman should do. It was disrespectful, according to, from Martha's point of view. But listen Why to Jesus. Is controversial? Because only a man would be allowed to sit at the feet of a rabbi to listen oh, to instruction. Yeah, And Martha picks up on it. So verse 40, Martha was uh, distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. Notice she doesn't speak to her sister directly because she thinks her sister is being disrespectful. She's telling Jesus to talk to her sister. She's not speaking directly to her sister because her sister is the youngest sister. She, the sister, Mary should already know what she's doing. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, it is, isn't it? Verse 41. But the Lord answered her, Martha, 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 Martha. Uh, the, double, the double word is a term of compassion, not of anger. He's not saying Martha, Martha. He's saying Martha, Martha. You're worried and distracted by so many things. The, the word for distracted is being a busybody. You're, you're being a busybody. You're restless. My father would say you have ants in your pants. <laughs> you're worried and distracted by so many things. There is need of only one thing. And Mary has chosen the good part. Does anybody have better? <clears throat> better part? Yes. Scratch it out, put good. The word is good, not better. Why would it be better? The reason why your English translation has better is because the church tradition has said that Mary is better than Martha. Because Mary is listening to Jesus, and Mary is, is, is doing Jesus. And interpreters, preachers over the years, primarily Catholic again, okay, the English tradition, stated that Mary is better, one, because she's listening to Jesus, two, because she doesn't complain, and three, because she's silent. It's because she's quiet. She doesn't complain. And so your English translation picks up on the English bias that was that goes back. I'm not sure what the King James Version says. It's say good or better, Mitzi. Good. So the King James Version has it correct. Good. Go with the King James. The right choice is, is well. That's that's misleading too. Now the good part, the good portion, the part. The word part means portion of bread. 
So I want to read it literally for you. Mar- Mary, Mary, there's only need of one more thing. Mary has chosen the good portion of bread. What is he referring himself to? As the bread of life. What is Mar- Martha doing? She's baking bread. She's making food. And what he's saying is that you're making food to satisfy our hunger. But Mary has chosen the good bread, the good portion of bread. The word portion is, is bread. Not bread, literally, but it points to a portion or measure of food. And so she's, he's saying that I am the bread of life. My teaching is what provides nourishment. And she has chosen a good portion, not a better portion, a good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Notice he doesn't, what he's doing is he's, he's not saying Mary's better than you or Mary chose a better portion. What he's saying is you need to choose. You can provide hospitality. You can sit at my feet, but the point is choose. And what you're seeing is that her hospitality is necessary for the nourishment of the movement. But you have to balance the Martha in your life, which is always go, 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 with the Mary in your life. One is not better than the other. They both have an equal place. And some of y'all favor Martha more than Mary. Okay? And I doubt any of you are lazy enough to favor Mary over Martha. Because my, my, my guess is that you're busier than you should be, right? But what the story says is that Jesus, Jesus says there's a place for Martha and Mary. You're both performing a function. It's just you need to choose. Um, and, uh, and, there's, uh, and there's that important word. The point is uh, that I want to leave you with is that Mary is participating in the life of a male as a, as a of what would be otherwise a male pupil of a rabbi and what it shows is that Jesus is opening these doors of of these women who are participating in his life in equal measure as as others and that opens up and, and when you get to the book of acts and the spirit falls on the whole church it explodes everyone's included men women children eunuchs eunuchs the first Gentile to be baptized is not only an Ethiopian, but a eunuch. Are you kidding me? And then, not to make matter, not to make it worse, two chapters later, Cornelius, a centurion, the enemy of our people, is now a believer. Really? Peter, come on now. Well, I saw a sheet, and the sheet came down. And God told me straight out, do not call unclean what I have determined clean, and do not call clean what I have determined unclean. Amen. And the whole church explodes until we get to the Catholic Church by the third century. And then it bottles up and it becomes about power and consolidation, and it goes downhill from there. And we're fighting the wars of our ancestors for the last 1,500 years. And that is the story for today. <laughs> Let's